Well, Mr. Jan Botmans, thank you for being here and thank you for uh, okay. agreeing uh, to do this interview. It's uh, really nice to meet you. Uh, my first question is, you have founded uh, four successful uh, organizations, ISIS, Drift, uh, Kaganda and Nederland Council. And uh, in the light specifically also uh, for Green Offices and uh, Wageningen, who has many thriving uh, young organizations, sustainability organizations in general. Um, what would your tip for ambitious young people be uh, who want to start up their own sustainability initiative? Okay, good question. Uh, my advice would be uh, keep it simple. All the institutes and organizations that I established were network organizations, flat, horizontal, uh, with a distinct leader and also a very good manager and also from the idea that we were not important, the organization or institution, but the goal that we wanted to achieve. So we said literally, uh, when I started Urgenda and also Nederland Kantel, when we have achieved our goals, um, we are going to, let's say, end up this. So the organization is not the goal. <laughs> so we will stop as soon as we have achieved our goals and keep it simple. Uh, I always work with 10, 15 people, not more than that. Because otherwise, if you grow too big, you become institutionalized and organized and then you start to, let's say, uh, worry and concern about the organization itself. And that's a waste of your time and energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in what way can, for example, organizations like Green Offices, who are also embedded in universities, um, contribute to the energy transition or transition in general of the uh, society that we are uh, experiencing right now? Well, uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, the universities themselves need to be transformed because I think the whole idea of sustainability is still underdeveloped within universities, also within my own university in Rotterdam. So it should be part of each and every course as a kind of a basic stuff. And secondly, the universities need to contribute to the energy transition themselves. So all the buildings on the campus needs to be energy neutral or in the far future energy delivery. Yeah. So uh, when we started Urgenda, that was one of our goals, to make all the campus of uh, all the universities energy neutral within 10 years. I think that's relatively easy to do that. So you also need to work from a vision and a specific goal. Yeah. What do you want to achieve here at this university? Uh, and th there's really a lot you can do yeah. in terms of energy, uh, food, in terms of materials. And I see that popping up all over at each and every university. Also in the United States, the universities and the core students working on, let's say, the divestment movement to stay away from, let's say, investment in fossil fuels was really born in the universities. Yeah. Well, you actually also uh, uh, answered my next question, which would have been what can and what should the universities themselves do and also in the light of course uh, of for example Wageningen which is a very international and uh, renowned university in terms of sustainability um, what would your advice be for the university like what can we still do how can we contribute further to the change also in terms of um, changing the society itself well that's a that's a tricky point because you are working at a famous university very innovative uh, very uh, much contributing to, let's say, innovative uh, agriculture and agri-food production. But on the one hand, there is still a dominant, well, let's say, framing here uh, about thinking what the most promising, if not sustainable, way of food producing and consuming might be. And that dominant school I think that people like you and others need to oppose to that because that is still rooted in the old, uh, let's say, fossil fuel agro-industrial framing mm -hmm. that largely contribute to global climate change. Yes. So the intensive uh, way we produce here food has brought us a lot. We are uh, the largest food exporter in the world after the United States. Yeah. But the way in which we do that 
we waste an enormous amount of energy, an enormous amount of materials, so that contributes largely to climate change. And we want to export that all over the world. But then you also export, let's say, the harmful effects that it has. So I think that, that people like you and others hopefully can also stand up against that school and balance it a little bit more. There are alternative ways of producing food yeah. in a more sustainable, sustainable way. It's really interesting that you said that because um, our uh, academic year started with the speech from uh, uh, Professor Arthur Moll about disruptive thinking and that the university wants to encourage disruptive thinking at the university. And uh, you're working a lot, for example, right now, uh, specifically on the energy use. Yep. There was just a letter about the coal plants that should be shut down uh, yep. right before COP21. Um, what would you think, uh, do, you, do you think we also need more disruptive thinking in terms of sustainability, that we put our focus more on other things, and if so, which would the uh, main topics be that you think are not enough in the, in the limelight, so to say? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> I'm really enthusiastic about disruptive thinking. The whole lecture I gave was actually on disruptive mm -hmm. thinking. And that means actually what people teach you, don't take that for granted. If people teach you that the industrialized way that we have, let's say, uh, created over the past 50 years in producing food is the only way, please stand up against that and, and be as disruptive as possible. There's a variety of alternatives that you can follow. So disruptive means uh, stand up against linear thinking stand up against everything that is taken for granted in each and every field. Uh, also try to think in a more circular manner rather than a linear manner. Uh, also try to be as reflexive as possible. Um, so if a professor tells something to you, what is his world view behind it? What is his human view? Um, and, 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 and from which school does he come? So disruptive means for me, and that's the reason why I call transitions, let's say, radical, transformative or disruptive change. And the biggest barrier is you know, between our ears. Yeah. And, and uh, I gave you lots of examples. Uh, when I started working on the energy transition, people could not imagine that we will turn into a sustainable energy system within one generation. Uh, and therefore, that's where I ended up with. Uh, everybody said that it was impossible. Until somebody came along who didn't know that. Oh, well, he is a disruptor. Who yeah. didn't know that? <laughs> yeah, very, yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with you. Um, also considering the, the global um, effect of, for example, climate change, I mean, it's not just a local thing, it's a global thing, and uh, yeah, every nation uh, is affected by it. What advice would you also give uh, international organizations who work on uh, sustainability or in, in other nations to achieve the same success that you did, to people all around the world who want to start up something similar, for example, as a uh, agenda? Well, when we started Eugenia, people discouraged us. Um, and actually, everything where I started with, people tried to discourage me. When I started working on climate change, my director said, and, and he, later he was affiliated to the University of Wageningen, uh, I won't give his name, but my director <laughs> said, uh, stop with this, it's too, too uncertain, this problem. And you should really work on uh, a model for uh, acid rain. And I was stubborn. I said, no, this intrigues me. And he said, okay, but I don't want you to come out with the results because we need to validate them a couple of times. But I was stubborn, so I did my master's on it and even my PhD, although only a few people liked what I did. When I created Eugenia, people said, there are already a lot of NGOs, so why do we need another one? Well, we thought that it was a good idea. So first, do not listen too much to other people trying to discourage you. If you really think it's a good idea, go for it. Uh, secondly, uh, stay away from the money thing. 
if there is a good idea and you have a plan, there's always money. Don't blur your idea and vision and strategy with money, because then you spend 90% of your time with uh, getting money. Don't do that. It's all about creativity, uh, disruptive thinking, trying to find the right partners. One or two is enough. I always work together with one or two people who had the same kind of thinking and then create a kind of small network and then think on a daily basis about how can we make the difference. And uh, for instance, we spent five months with people who said Urtienda is not uh, the right name. I came with it because, well, it is urgent and it requires action, an agenda, and what needs to be done. And there were uh, the marketing people who spent time with us and said, no, you need to profile yourself and you need an image building process. And it's all a waste of time. Don't interfere with the marketeers and with the people who want to earn money uh, on your idea. Stay away from it. Try to focus on your own goals, own vision. 15 people is enough. And even with three or four people, you can make a difference. The right combination of a front runner, a connector, and a toppler yeah. might be very, very effective. And, and, and mostly, it starts from a whole lot of energy, and then you maintain that for a year, and then something is going wrong, and then the energy level drops, and then after two years, people say, we don't believe in it anymore. So you need to keep up the energy level high and you need to focus on one success within two years. Yeah. One successful intervention or action. That gives you energy and then you go on to the next. Nice. Um, now we've talked about uh, uh, more smaller organizations, um, but of course there's also something bigger coming up, namely the uh, COP21 in Paris. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, oh, you also notice that uh, politicians are sometimes a bit afraid to make clear statements and many are still very cynical about uh, also the urgency of climate change in the first place. But on the other hand side, you also have uh, countries, for example, China, that just uh, uh, announced that they want to uh, cut their carbon emissions and switch to 20% uh, renewable energies within the next 15 years. Um, in the light of uh, these differences, do you think that uh, a big event like COP21 um, is the necessary step for making an energy transition? It's not enough, but it is necessary. It's not sufficient. And I try to explain in my college that you need and the bottom-up movement mm -hmm. that is really growing exponentially all over the world and you need a kind of top-down mechanism, a political. It's more a societal element and a political element in combination. I've seen the urgency growing over the decades. The fact that the Pope now uh, intervenes is extremely important. The fact that the world leaders take it seriously is really for the very first time. The fact that there is an immense pressure from society yeah. is uh, different. The fact that there are many, many multinationals um, that uh, say we need leadership uh, from politicians. People like Paul Polman of Unilever and Peter Bakker from the World Business Council of Sustainable Development, that has changed. When I started 30 years ago, the government called me and said, Jan, how can we get the ordinary people and the companies on board? Yeah. Now the companies and the people say, how can we get the government on board? That is a huge transition in 30 years. So we need a COP, we shouldn't be overly optimistic because it's a complicated process with still many uh, barriers. But I think there's reason for optimism. I think that something substantive will come out of it. Um, and, and, and that we are aiming towards, let's say, 40% reduction in 20, 2030. And then the whole question comes down, how are we going to control it? How are we going to make this legally binding? But that requires a whole administration. And for the very first time, we start now with the world leaders and then being followed up by the bureaucrats. Yeah. Normally, the bureaucrats come together for 10 days and then the world leaders fly in and they have one day to round it off. And, 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 and there's now a reverse and that's very interesting. 
that might be also a different path to success. Yeah, you were just now also pointing out the uh, importance of society and societal change, and you yeah. also um, pointed that out with the, the most recent initiative, Nederland Council. Um, do you think that the recent ban on protests and demonstrations around Paris uh, can influence or will influence negotiations that will happen? Uh, no, I don't think so. That That's more a matter of ceremony for the media yeah. and the press. You know, you should not forget that um, uh, when we started with the cops, there were a few hundreds of us. Um, nowadays, you are talking about 30, 40,000 people. The majority of them has nothing to do uh, in terms of uh, making a difference, but wants to be part of that ceremony. So there are many, many side events now and demonstrations that have been cancelled because they are not allowed in Paris. Mm -hmm. But it won't have any impact on the negotiations. The negotiations is a different part. That's fully in the hands of bureaucrats and po politicians and world leaders. And of course, they take notice of all the side events and the protests. But let's say there has already been built up an enormous pressure on them to make the difference. And if it will fail now, there will be another cup at which it will be arranged. There's no escape anymore. But the pressure is growing and growing each and every day now until they do what's really necessary. Um, so I'm even doubting whether I will go myself because uh, it's, it's not, well, the most comfortable place to be mm -hmm. in Paris now in, yeah. in these weeks. True. Um, then one final question. Um, Considering uh, what, what you just explained and also the COP21 coming up and the transition that society is already going through, uh, what would be your most wishful thinking, how you would like to see uh, society and uh, this transition in the upcoming five years? Well, I'm crossing, uh, uh, let's say, the Netherlands and other European countries. I see a lot of energy among ordinary citizens who really want to take it in their own hands, in each and every field. And I hope the next five years that the government allows them to realize their own local sustainable solutions, whether it is in sustainable energy or food production or building. Uh, but I see an enormous amount of energy, more than one million people are already actively involved. But they face many barriers. There's still a lot of resistance. And I hope that they get the space, uh, the, uh, the legal, uh, organizational, mental, financial space to realize their dreams. That's what I hope. Because it's all about positive energy. Never ever a transition has been realized from pessimism or uh, cynicism. You can only achieve a real successful transition based on positive energy and inspiration. Thank you very much for the interview. My pleasure. pleasure talking to you. Yeah. And uh, we'll hopefully to see you around in Wageningen. <laughs> yeah, next year. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, right. thank you.